Welcome to the Barometer Readings Monthly Conference Call. My name is Bakiba, and I will be your operator for today's call. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. Later, we will conduct a question and answer session. Please note that this conference is being recorded. I will now turn the call over to Nick Hamilton. Nick Hamilton, you may begin. Thank you very much, Operator. Um, hi, everybody, and welcome to the monthly Barometer Readings conference call, where, uh, as usual, we revisit the Barometer Discipline Leadership Approach, and we apply it to the global market landscape with some commentary directly from uh, Dave Burroughs. Um, as you know, these calls are part of our ongoing commitment to transparency and regular review of the, uh, the leadership themes and what our breadth model indicators are revealing in terms of opportunity, but also the areas to avoid. Um, thank you as well for your continued interest in our firm, um, the tactical approach we take, and the investment solutions we offer private investors. So on the last call we had, we, we emphasized uh, a market environment uh, today which clearly continues to de demonstrate pockets of strength and pockets of weakness. Um, we define these markets as have and have not markets. This type of environment is, is very favorable, we believe, to the overall barometer approach. Um, and, you know, at being targeted, which is what it's all about, has been of significant value in this type of market. So if you look uh, as of today, where the broad market in Canada, the TSX, is up about 2.4%, uh, the barometer strategies are up anywhere from above 6% to above 16 And I'll just run through those. Uh, so the barometer high income uh, pool and income advantage fund, both up above 6%. Barometer equity strategy, 9.3. Uh, barometer global uh, tactical, up 6.6. Uh, uh, barometer uh, long short equity, up about 15%. Uh, barometer tactical exchange uh, traded pool, up about uh, 15% and then the uh, barometer global equity pool uh, up above 16%. So uh, in particular, it's worth noting uh, that the opportunities outside Canada continue to become more and more compelling, and we're pleased with those results, although a year ago our models were much more Canadian-focused. Um, but, you know, what current market leadership has increasingly comes at the come at the hands of sectors such as healthcare, consumer names, and U.S. financials, to name a few. Um, geographically, this has led us to a U.S. overweight, but we probably also highlight specific emerging markets such as Mexico, Thailand, Philippines, as other foreign market opportunities. So at this point, I'll turn the call over to Dave to run through things in more detail and speak to our more current observations and positioning. So Dave? Hey, folks. Thanks for taking the time. Uh, I recognize that as we get further into the warm weather, the participation may thin a little. Uh, so uh, hopefully people get some value out of these calls because uh, I know that some people like to go to the golf course. Um, just just quickly, uh, uh, you know, this you know clearly is our kind of market. Uh, it plays into our strengths. Uh, we're in a market where there are definitely uh, a number of groups that I think are confounding some strategists, uh, behaving remarkably well. Uh, I think many of the defensive sectors have acted a whole lot better than. Than, than a lot of Canadian strategists would point to. I think that a lot of the cyclicals uh, have been more frustrating uh, for uh, some managers and some strategists who would say, you know, over the last few months this should have been what was rallying. Um, but uh, as, as we like to say, I think that the tools that we use are pretty good at, at helping us understand what is working uh, and then find ideas within those camps that have you know, fundamental characteristics that point to something changing for the better or a reason for revaluation, uh, and price characteristics that support the view. And uh, as a result, I think that the portfolio is right now extremely well targeted uh, for two things. You know, one, obviously, to generate a return, but I think the second thing is uh, to carry a risk characteristic that, that, that our clients can all live with. Um, you know, we're, we spend a lot of time focused on the number, you know, what is the number so far on the year, and that's an important one, you know, but at what cost? And I think one of the interesting things that I've always noted is when you get into, you know, clear market leading themes, the leading themes have lots of buyers waiting under the surface, waiting for any opportunity to, 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 to buy pullbacks. 
and and what we've seen, you know, now for like three years, is very steady progression in a lot of the yield producing themes. And from time to time, we get a bout of uh, some better economic data. Some folks decide to rotate uh, to more cyclical groups. Those rallies have, for now, three years lasted for short periods of time, while the the, uh, the defense has had a little bit of a rest. And uh, after a little while, the defenses pick up steam again, and the cyclicals uh, run into run into headwinds. So it's not to say you can't see that rotation take place as we go forward. If if some of the, the capital from uh, monetary policy transmits through into the real economy, uh, and we're seeing it in pockets. Um, but as a broad theme, it does not appear yet to be you know market leadership. So let me just start um, with the income pool and the income advantage fund. So as of today, and I know that we've been slowly bringing the portfolio holdings in line one with the other, uh, they are both roughly up about the same over the course of the year. Uh, both have had pretty low volatility, about a third of the volatility of, mar- of equities. Um, certainly, the makeup of the portfolio has been fairly steadily for a year now, working its way towards dividend-paying equities as the core in the portfolio uh, as fixed income weights have come down, and I think that's understandable. Realistically, the spreads over Canada, so the risk premium we're getting paid to own corporate debt, is getting more narrow. Uh, it does not have provide you know significant cushion in the event that we got a, a rate back up, which which doesn't appear to be happening at this point. But certainly um, the risk reward appears to be favoring dividend paying equities. You know we we talk a lot about why we want to own equities right now in this portfolio. I think the big story is not specifically the great yield that we can get because the running yield in the portfolio is, is a little lower than it has been. Uh, equity pool. Uh, is sitting around 5%, just a sniff below, and the equity fund, uh, sorry, the uh, the income advantage fund would be about 4%. Um, it's specifically because we are seeing exceptional dividend growth. So, you know, let me try and quantify dividend growth for you. I mean, if if, if you if you look at the big numbers over a long period of time, it really accentuates the value. You go back to 1985, the dividend paid coming out of the S&P 500 was about $30 billion. And last year, it was just shy of $300 billion. So the dividend stream coming out of the S&P over that period of years basically has gone up uh, by 10 times. And, And, you know, recently we've been focusing on the fact that dividend growth is accelerating. You know, we made the case where eventually balance sheets get so strong, in the absence of opportunity to grow, CEOs are going to be prepared to pay it out. And last year, you know, I think we highlighted the 50% of our holding CEOs dividend increases. And, and now, you know, really in the first four months of the year, we're through 50% of our holding CEOs dividend increases this year. And, and if you look at the number of dividend increases uh, in U.S. equity market, you know, it's an order of magnitude higher than where it was at this point last year. So that is a theme that's certainly accelerating. And, and within that theme, you know, it continues to be supported as one that could go on for a long time because dividend payout now is about 32%. So, yeah, it's up from 26, but it's nowhere near 50, which is long-term average, and, and a whole long way away from where it was in the 50s, 60s, and 65, 70%. So, you know, this is this is continuing on. The second thing is along that line is people become more focused on it, multiples are expanding. So we're getting paid for a little bit of growth, we're getting paid for the yield, and we're getting an expanded multiple, which is why, you know, some of the more defensive sectors continue to be leading uh, market in the U.S. year to date. The second thing that, that Nick made mention to is that, you know, we have been fairly steadily raising our exposure across all of our portfolios to U.S. securities. And, you know, for obvious reasons, some of the sectors like healthcare and consumer staples and media are really well represented in the U.S. consumer discretionary fund, some of the financials. Uh, and so there's, there's a lot of opportunity. But, you know, in the, in the, in the same breath, uh, breath, breath, breath uh, outside when we look at the Canadian market, you know, relatively weak commodity prices have had a tendency to point towards uh, a weaker Canadian dollar. 
the other data point I'd point to is that any time over the last 30 years you had discrepancy between economic or GDP growth in Canada versus GDP growth in the U.S., a greater than a 1%, you know, you had upwards of 10% depreciation in Canadian dollar. So we're getting a slowing Canadian economy and you're getting uh, slowing housing markets and you're getting slowing commodity prices. And, you know, it, it makes sense, frankly, that Canadian dollar works its way a little lower. And we're seeing that. I think that probably the strength of our fiscal situation has held the Canadian dollar stronger than would otherwise be the case. You take a look at Australia, you know, certainly their currency has come down a lot quicker with a very similar backdrop to our Canadian currency. Uh, but in, in the scheme of things, we're making this call for two reasons. One, we think the currency probably continues to devalue. And second, you know, we see lots of opportunities. So. Let me talk in broad brush, just from the top down, what we're seeing going on in our breadth models. Because you can't pick up the newspaper without having somebody tell you we're about to have a correction uh, and that we're extended and that lots of themes are expensive. But the fact is, you know, our breadth models aren't showing any sign of it. Overall, if you look across the globe, pretty uniform expanding breadth. So that means that as time goes by, more and more securities are participating in this rally. Now, there's certainly some weaker markets like Canada uh, and Australia and Brazil and to some extent China, more economically sensitive markets. Um, but uh, really, through uh, the U.S., through some of the core in Europe, through some of the periphery in Asia, and certainly Japan, we're seeing very strong breadth. The short-term models that look at things like the percentage of stock trading above the 50-day moving average, percent of stock trading above the 200-day moving average, percent of stocks with positive price momentum, and the percentage of stocks trading new highs versus new lows, all are hitting new highs. So this is a double-edged sword. Of course it means that things, uh, uh, lots of things are doing well, it means that we are in one of the most productive periods we've been in for some number of years. You look at what's happening in portfolios that are well positioned, you know, we're getting good lifts regularly on any bump in markets. Even sideways days, we're getting good, good moves. So that's, that's the constructive piece. It's a productive time to be invested, and lots of things are doing well. There is, of course, always risk that there could be correction at any point. And that's something you know that we really, compared to almost anybody, are extremely focused on. We just don't see evidence of it yet at this point. If we start to see deterioration in those short-term models, you'll see us get a little more cautious. Uh, if we see deterioration at the sector level, you'd see us become more cautious. And frankly, on the other hand, if you saw breadth start to improve in some of the deep cyclical sectors, we would become more aggressive in those areas. Um, and maybe there's one area right now we're seeing a little bit of improvement, which I'll talk a little bit about today. Uh, but in general, if I take start start with the income portfolio, clearly uh, midstream energy continues to chug along, lots of stocks making regular new highs, and of course the earnings figures are great. Uh, the REITs continue to be very strong, albeit we are more focused in the U.S. now than in Canada, trying to take advantage of some of the pockets of improving housing pricing uh, and the confidence that comes along with that. Uh, the um, the uh, exposure to financials, you know, is not insignificant. You know, this is a big part of our, our portfolios, anywhere from sort of 17 to 25 percent, depending on the portfolio. But again, largely focused in the U.S. And far from just being bank portfolios, we do have some bank exposure. Again, go to the strongest ones in the group, the ones with the best numbers, the best price performance those are the ones probably most likely to give us dividend growth. But then beyond that, to the insurance companies, same thing, those most likely to raise dividends or do share buybacks. Uh, and then third, and probably the, a little bit further out the risk curve, the asset managers, both in Canada and the U.S., you know, uh, we may not run money for CI any longer, but we own the shares in the company. We think it's well run. Uh, we own shares in Vesco, we own shares in uh, Black, uh, uh, Blackstone. Um, so we have some exposure in that group, uh, and that continues to do well. Um, we have 
started to add a little bit more energy exposure, both in the income portfolio and equity portfolios. And, and that's just, you know, I talk about this because it allows me to revisit what it takes for us to go in a group from having a very low weight, you know, to start trying to take advantage of new strengths that we're seeing taking place. In the U.S., we know that we've seen a big boom in production uh, because of the, the fracking in the shale uh, and the, what that's done for production. Um, one, one particular area in the U.S., has been problematic, and that's the Permian Basin, which is a long history of, of very prolific production. And one area that, one, one thing that has yet to be unlocked, or has been yet to be unlocked, is, is the sand in the Permian Basin, which holds a tremendous amount of oil. And there are a few companies that appear to be on the verge of some reasonably significant uh, breakthroughs in their ability to unlock the sand. And these companies are companies that I've watched now for 18 months behaving much better than the rest of the group. So we look for groups that have been out of favor, and clearly lots of oil producers have been out of favor as pricing has been weak. Um, we look for those that have numbers that point to something changing for the better and price characteristics that would support the view. These companies have been basically basing out and, and, and working their way higher against a group that has been relatively unproductive. Uh, and, and then we look for some beginnings and expanding breadth. We're seeing some improvement in the, in the producers uh, sector. Um, we are seeing uh, some stocks at new highs, and I'll point out a couple like, uh, like Pioneer uh, and Fang, uh, both of which are in the Permian Basin. Uh, there are uh, mid-streamers in, the, in those areas that are seeing rising production. Crosstex would be one of them, XDXI. Uh, and uh, it appears that on the first sign of real strength in the energy producers, these things are breaking out to new highs. So we start with partial positions. So in the, uh, the high-income pool, uh, sorry, high-income fund energy makes up about 8%. Uh, and we're building a weight there in the in the high income pool, and then of course we're carrying it over into the equity pools as well. So energy taking on a little bit of a life. Uh, telecom continues to be about five percent of the portfolios, uh, and uh, and then we've got a smattering of other groups. The one difference you will see that continues to be the case is that the income advantage fund still has a significantly lower fixed income weight. Uh, the barometer high income pool has about 11%, so I think probably the last conference call it was at 15. So we have been taking that down. Uh, the, the spreads are still fairly narrow. See, on the other side, there's been very little issuance of corporate debt. We like to look at new issue debt because we don't have to pay a big spread, bid offer spread to buy the issues. Um, and in the absence of a lot of new deals coming, we're pre preferring to sit on our hands and wait for the right opportunities. Uh, the other thing that we have been doing is we have been reducing our exposure to resource. We've made a lot of money in corporate debt that we own in the resource space, and we just think that there are some vulnerabilities there. So uh, both income portfolios are kind of chugging along. Uh, both, I think, are, are giving us a good return. Both, I think, have a very good bid underneath the market. So I think there's very little risk. Uh, and, you know, risk against volatility, I think, is, is quite attractive. Now, we have uh, pretty steadily, as the equity theme has been working, in our own business, been adding equity exposure across portfolios. Um, you know, the equity strategy now is, I don't know, 22 years of, of, of history behind it, and it's been a great strategy over time. Uh, as of sort of October, November last year, all of our equity strategies really seem to have kicked into gear uh, and, are, and are making great strides. So we're taking advantage of the same themes, although uh, we augment those with some uh, ancillary themes that are playing off this progression of money slowly working its way with the risk curve. So I think the one area that is a little bit more cyclical that is seeing a pickup is consumer, consumer cyclical and consumer discretionary. And this, over the last few months, has been, I guess, about the strongest part of the market uh, and uh, picking up on a relative strength basis. Um, so consumer discretionary in the equity pool is about 12%, and really you could put that together with media, which is another 9 to make 
Uh, so in, in the consumer discretionary space, let's, let's, let's just define that um, as being uh, uh, the housing related, which for us would be companies like KB Homes and Home Depot. Home Depot, absolutely tremendous numbers today. Uh, if, we, if we had to pick one company in this theme, you know, we've used it as top picks recently on a couple of uh, uh, media outlets. Uh, Home Depot would be it. You know, great example, again, of what we're looking for. A group that went through a deep valley, uh, went through significant distribution. Uh, this company, uh, through that period of time, used its balance sheet uh, and used its strength to get stronger. They rationalized a number of stores. They bought back well, like $30 billion worth of shares. Um, they uh, recently had a 25% dividend increase. They committed to buy another $4 billion worth of shares in the marketplace. Um, and, and they're just, just churning out cash. So they built their presence at a time when the industry was weak. They come out the other side stronger. And you can see today they beat on the margin side, they beat on the, on the revenue side, they beat on the earnings front, uh, and guided, guided the street higher. So that's a perfect example, strong stock, strong fundamentals, strong price behavior in a group that's seeing some improvement. Uh, retail is, is a big exposure for us. Um, probably the biggest exposure we have there is in the ETF portfolio in the global equity pool. Uh, auto, companies like Magna, uh, very strong balance sheet, same thing, one going through the decline and then media. So all of those groups would fit into that sort of consumer cyclical space, uh, and they, they are a big focus for us. Uh, in the transport, the rails are a feed off of uh, the strength in oil and gas production. You should know that there is a view that appears to be developing in the marketplace that perhaps the best way to deal with the boom in production is first to deal with it by rail because the assets are mobile. Uh, it is a flexible network that allows uh, the, um, the company servicing the oil and gas industry to move assets from A to B, get product to market faster, uh, and the cost to move it uh, is coming down. So, uh, you know, CP and CNR are both, both winners from this, uh, uh, and there are others in the U.S and this is probably a theme that we'll continue to focus on. Energy, as I mentioned, is, is growing in weight in the portfolio. Uh, more specifically, uh, some U.S. weighting uh, and some of the yield-driven names in Canada uh, that have the right assets and the right geographies. Um, and then the, the last piece that I would point to is we are seeing some real strength in peripheral Asia. And while the, while the Shanghai exchange has, from a relative price performance uh, basis, been, been weak. Uh, it's because it's dominated by capital equipment and heavy construction and infrastructure. And what is very small in the index and really doesn't show up much is the impact from the consumer. And the countries that surround China providing the, the Chinese consumer market, Singapore, Malaysia, Indonesia, Philippines, are performing extremely well, and we're trying to take advantage of that, both through the global equity pool and the ETF pool. Um, so uh, I think that the themes seem to be working. We still are very, very light on uh, basic materials. We still have, have uh, certainly up until now been short the golds, uh, and we have still have a small short position in the golds. Uh, they're getting a little extended to the downside, uh, but no significant sign that that is reversing at this point. Uh, we are underweight Canada. We certainly are underweight Canadian dollar. Uh, and, um, and then the last piece would be a fairly sizable weight in Japan, both on the global equity pool and the ETF pool. And there is no sign whatsoever that the depreciation in the yen is finished. And we're taking advantage of Japan using uh, uh, currency hedged ETF. Uh, which gives us the upside in the Nikkei with protection on the currency. So that's a mouthful, I know, um, but I think that if I were to wrap it up and say this, certainly we're in a broad-based rally. Uh, I think that things uh, favor the equity asset class. Uh, Short-term indicators are high but showing no signs of turning down. 
we're in a market where there's some very targeted leadership. We're on the lookout for new opportunities should we see rotation in the market. Uh, and, uh, and I guess I would highlight that the equity strategies are per- performing you know, particularly well, and we're using them as a diversifier uh, alongside of the income pool uh, for a sort of second source of return. So with that, I'll pass it back to Nick. Great. Uh, operator, we'll uh, entertain questions at this time. Operator, can we uh, can we check for questions at this time? The keybot? Well, it appears our operator's gone AWOL. No. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. I was on mute. <laughs> I was on mute. We'll begin the question and answer session now. So if you have a question, please press star, then one on your touchtone phone. If you wish to be removed from the queue, please press the pound sign or the hash key. There will be a delay before the first question is announced. And if you're using a speakerphone, you may need to pick up the handset first before pressing the numbers. Once again, if you have a question, please press star, then one on your touchtone phone. And please stand by for questions. Okay, and at this time, we have no questions. Okay. Uh, Nick, I'll let you wrap it up. Yeah, we'll wrap it up. And uh, by all means, if questions occur to you after this call, feel free to call myself or Sarah. But thanks for everyone's attention, as usual. Um, a quick synopsis. Obviously, breath models do point to a pretty productive time to be invested. But as usual, we uh, continue to employ our uh, defensive uh, metrics, if warranted, to protect uh, investors. Um, in general, we're, uh, we continue to favor sectors that have a growing ability to pay investors and a belief that predictability of dividends will continue to command higher multiples. And so this is driven primarily on, on, the, on the fact that the appetite for clarity and certainty continues to be very high among private investors. Um, so this has uh, led us to increase allocations to the U.S., and as David mentioned, uh, within the high income pool and income advantage fund, our U.S. weightings are 40% and growing. Um, you know, on this point, we'd probably also advocate a more concerted look at uh, pools like the global equity pool or tactical ETF, uh, as these uh, provide increased global exposure and are highly complementary to the, the barometer income pool or fund. Uh, for example, the global pool has a correlation of about 0.4 to the income strategy, and, and over 80% of the names held are income producing. Uh, so again, highly complementary and, and gets a bit more uh, exposure to uh, to global. Um, but again, being very targeted in our investment approach is uh, yielding uh, considerable near-term performance across all our mandates. So it's it's worthwhile opportunity to explore with us. Uh, call myself or Sarah to explore that uh, in more detail. So with that, we'll conclude the call and uh, look forward to talking with you next month. Thank um, you. Pardon the interruption, Mr. Hamilton. We did have Brian queue up for a question. We have a question? Great. Sure. Yes, Brian Jones, go ahead and ask your question. I was sitting here. When he was talking about the energy sector in, in Canada, I think he was talking about the U.S. and Canada, but was he talking about the service sector too or just the energy stocks themselves? Oh, great, great question. So uh, I think that we're seeing some improvement in services, we're seeing some improvement in equipment, and we're seeing some improvement in, uh, in the producers themselves. But again, it's not broad-based. It's targeted and it's geographically targeted. So I think you really have to pick your spots. Some of the equipment folks, obviously, it's a technology market. So there are companies that have the right technology that are winning business, and they're being able to help help uh, producers bring down their costs of finding. You know, so I could point to a company like Core Labs in that space. That's a U.S. company that has a lot of technology around, you know, making efficient use of a reservoir. Uh, if you look at uh, the producers, they talk about Pioneer. You know, being very strong in the Permian, and there's, there's, there appears to be a big opportunity there, and they seem to be in the cusp of taking advantage of it. Um, so, so I think you start 
with those areas that are most logical given the fact that we're seeing a little bit of stabilization in the group. If we start to see it spread, you'll see that. Now, you know, we've had some exposure to companies like Vermillion uh, in Canada, uh, and there, so depending on where the assets are and what type of, what type of, of, uh, of uh, resource they have. Um, but, you know, I think that there's some improvement taking place. I think, you know, frankly, another thing I didn't mention is it looks as though the U.S. is about to get more clear on energy policy, and if they become a little more supportive of not only drilling on private lands but on public lands, that could also be helpful. You know, the longer-term question is, with all of the new production coming on and the limited infrastructure to deal with it, you know, how long will prices stay at $95 a barrel? I think that's a big question. Um, and, you know, will the discounts for Canadian oil, you know, narrow as infrastructure comes on? Uh, that's, that's another question. Uh, so I think there's, there's there's no lack of questions around the sector, but I think if you can find the specific situations, uh, there's going to be winners and losers. Hey, thanks. And, uh, and our any next other question. Questions? Yes, and our next question comes from Nick. Go ahead, Nick. Hey, Dave. Hi, Nick. How are you? Not bad yourself. Just great. Dave, I'm trying to find an entry point to buy more of your funds. <laughs> you know, I'll tell you, Nick, it's, it's very interesting. I mean, uh, I think it's not lost on anybody. It's been a pretty uninterrupted march, you know, that we've seen across a bunch of different asset classes. And this liquidity has been a pretty powerful thing in the market. I saw, I saw an interesting comment from one of the, uh, one of the uh, uh, policymakers in the U.K. last week. And, you know, he said, his comment was, I'm not sure everyone understands how coordinated this monetary policy is across the globe. And, you know, fight us at your peril. And ultimately, I think it, it brings back the adage, you know, you really don't want to fight the Fed. And we're just, we're, I just think there is, there continues to be a mountain of cash that is undeployed. So, you know, what, what's nice to see is that the pullbacks in the leadership themes are really shallow. I mean, when was the last time we even saw a five percent pullback? It just it's it's a long time now. Well I think it's and, I think it's hundred and seventy days now. Yeah, and I mean and I mean we just don't I mean I I, I I I'm I'm always looking over my shoulder. I'm afraid of shadows. But the fact is there's there's no real thing I can point to at this point that tells me that uh that I should be. And and you know, we've had this ongoing discussion where a year ago I would have said with an 80% certainty that you'd get at least one more cyclical pullback in the secular bear market. As we work our way along, it's becoming increasingly clear that the bet the central bankers are making is we can't afford to see another cyclical decline. Let's try and get the market out one cycle early. And that's not impossible, I suppose. I mean, uh, you know, we clearly, like, like the S&P clearly has made it up and above the channel and it's staying here so far. Um, you know, you go back to 1982 and look at what led off the bottom. It's the same types of stocks that are leading right now. So the way I look at it is this. If it happens to be that the central banks have engineered an, a, an exit from this secular bear market one cycle early, well, wonderful. We're positioned, I think, in the stocks that led for the first period of time in the last secular bull market. If it turns out to be that growth rolls over, and that the recovery isn't sustainable. Well, it's not going to be the groups we're in right now that get beaned first. It's going to be the cyclicals that fail. And I think that we have very light exposure there. So I think there's not a lot of risk there. So in either case, I don't see a ton of scope for near-term pullback. And I know it's tough because I know there's lots of people out there who would like to be, you know, adding. Uh, and I think that's why markets are as resilient as they are right now. David, uh, do you subscribe to the theory that, like a lot of these companies that you talk about and the ones that we follow very closely, the, 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 the commonality of all these companies is that they seem to have very high barriers to entry, you know, mm-hmm. and, in a, and in basically in an environment today where you can't even get credit unless you're absolutely pristine, 
it seems like whoever is left standing, which is obviously the companies you've highlighted in your in your thesis, it's yeah. like there's like correct me if I'm wrong, but there's probably very little competition. Would you not agree with that? Well, like it's in the companies like you're, you're working, finding. You, yeah, I think you're working your way back towards a nifty fifty. Those that are there today with strong balance sheets have exceedingly low cost of capital. Mm-hmm. And it makes it very hard to attack them. You know, I mean, whether it's a financial barrier to entry or a regulatory one in the case of the energy infrastructure companies. Or just or environmental. Companies. Yeah. Right. I mean, th- these are these are big barriers. And financial services, you know, big barriers. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't want to be starting our company today, I can tell you. It would be a lot tougher. So I think where you've got a defendable uh, franchise... Uh, there's a lower cost of capital, and uh, it, it makes it tough tough to get knocked off. I mean, Dave, we were talking about this the other day, but, like, you, you take the grocery stores, right, and they're trading at, like, an 11 multiple, or the cigarette yeah. producers, and they're trading at 11 multiple, and they're now pushing up to almost a 15 multiple, and I guess that's because of the cost of capital. Well, it is, and I just don't want anybody to forget that in the 1960s, those same companies traded at 45 to 60 times earnings. Yeah, it's it's hard to find. I know, I get the story about how the multiples are getting higher and, you know, relative to the last 10 years, but last 10 years, what you wanted to pay for was global growth exposure, you know, exposure to uh, to to construction and infrastructure and all of those things, and today, I think what you want, what you want exposure to is what people can't get, and that's cash flow generation and, and yield. Yeah. And the multiples that we paid, high multiples you had paid in the 90 for growth, you paid high multiples in the in the, in the the early 2000s for cyclical. I think today where we're going is we're going to pay high multiples for cash flow. Well, it makes sense. I mean, it, it's like you've always said, you're paying a 50 multiple now for a 10-year bond yield. Yep. Yep. Would okay. you rather do that or buy something that, Doubled its dividend, or, or took its dividend up by ten times over the last, you know, twenty years. I'm just following you, Dave. Yeah, thank you. Following you, my friend. No, well, I appreciate. You I appreciate your thesis. Thank you. Very good. Are there any last questions? No, there are no more questions. Very good. So we'll conclude the call. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. Have a great time. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. This concludes today's conference. Thank you for participating. You may now disconnect.